prayer as we begin today. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful to us, Lord, that you're here with us this morning. God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for all that you are, all that you've done, Lord Jesus, that you finished everything on the cross, Father God, that we would be able to, to come, just call out your name, and God, that you're there, Father. I just pray that you be in this place this morning as we call out your name, Father, that you would just fill this room with your presence. Father, we thank you, Lord, for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Greet somebody this morning. Welcome to the church.
Father has it. My Father has it. Every single time, the Lord will provide. My Father has it. My Father has it.
God, that he has everything that we have need of, and he has this beautiful table spread for us that has everything that we have need of, everything. And he invites us there. He doesn't force you there. He invites you to come partake with him. But you have the choice to come sit at that table with him every single day to get what you need from him. And then when you do sit there, all he does is tell you how much he loves you. This morning, it reminded me this morning, I got up this morning, <laughs> I'm still w wiping sleep out of my eyes, and I hear the song by Stevie Wonder, Isn't She Lovely? <laughs> and my husband and my children were at the table in our living room or in our dining room, and they had some pretty little gifts for me, and it was precious words, and and I felt in that moment just loved. And when I walked into that table, I felt just overwhelmed with love in that moment. And that is what we get from the Lord every single day. But we have to choose to go to that place because we're busy. We just walk by. That looks good, God. Thank you. I got some things to do today. Help me. But we don't go and sit at that table and partake. And yet we're, we're lacking joy. We're lacking forgiveness. We're sad. We're angry. We're anxious. We're depressed. We've got all these things that were going on. And God has everything we have need of at that table. And all we have to do is go partake with him because he invites us to come sit at the table. That is God's goodness coming after us every day. It is pursuing us. He's saying, come. Come, take at the table with me. Come sit with me. And I've got everything that you have need of because he is good. Amen. His goodness is running after you today. So I encourage you to sit at the table with Jesus and He let him tell you how much he loves you today because I need that. You need that today. Amen. Because your goodness is running after. It's running after me.
my body is shaking, so if the hot flashes and the nervous sweats can get me through this this morning, then um, we know that God has done his job this morning. Um, it is not me. It is, I'm up here not by my own strength, but by the Lord's strength. Um, so I want to thank Pastor Zach for um, allowing me to speak. As Clint said, uh, during, worship, during prayer before worship practice a couple months ago, the Lord, I was sitting right over there, and the Lord said, you're going to be preaching on Mother's Day. And I was like, no. You know, do you ever do that when God speaks to you? And you're like, no, not me. And um, there's so many other anointed women that could be up here preaching today. So why would he choose me? And so I kind of put it out of my mind. And then um, when Zach asked me, I was just like not really in shock because I'm never amazed at what God does and how he puts things together. But I was really just in awe that God even chose me to talk to you today. Amen. Um, so I do not take this lightly. It is, um, it's nearly just a heavy burden to be up here um, and to speak the Lord's way. But I know that he is going to um, make me, help me get through this. Amen. You are so beautiful. You are just all so beautiful. This morning, I am a lover of people. Um, I just have a heart for people, and so if you ever catch me watching you or staring at you, I'm not being creepy. I'm just, you can ask my kids and my husband, I just love people, and I just love to, to look at you and, and watch you, and um, so yeah, that was weird. Okay, so um, <laughs> I just want to, um, I'm so grateful that my parents are here today. There was a, a moment where I thought, maybe I should tell my parents that I'm preaching. And then I thought, no, God will take care of that. And we saw them on Friday at uh, Brayson's kindergarten graduation. And they said, can we come to church on Sunday? And I'm like, well, yeah, because I'm preaching. So um, anyway, God um, led them here without me even doing it. And he's always so good about that. So I'm glad to finally be here because Clint's alarm went off at 4 o'clock this morning um, to wake him up to put the brisket on the smoker, and so I feel like I've been preaching to you in my bed since four o'clock this morning, so I'm glad to get this going already this morning. I titled my message this morning, Rooted in the Way. Really, I didn't title it. The Lord titled it for me. So if you would, if you have your Bibles, turn to Jeremiah 17. We're going to read five through eight. Starting in verse 5, this is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in uninhabited, salty land. Ouch. But there's always a but with God. Amen? Chapter 7, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a river bank, with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green, and they never stop producing fruit. Amen? Would you bow with me in prayer this morning? Father God, I'm just so humbled today. God, for so many years I've been praying that I wanted to be your hands and feet. And God, I thank you that um, it was a yes day for me. God, that with boldness I accepted the challenge, God, to speak to your people. So God, I pray that you would just use the words that you've given me with confidence and grace, Lord Jesus, this morning. In your precious name, amen. So looking at those verses, we you know which one you would want to choose, right? Um, you're smart. It's, it's an easy choice. We don't want to choose verses 5 and 6 that um, says that we're going to live by our own prideful flesh that results in stunted blessings with no hope or future, a barren life, unable to produce fruit because you, we, we get so wrapped up in the me, the me, 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 me. Instead, when we trust in the Lord, we can be blessed with hope and confidence, amen, in my todays and tomorrows, able to withstand the pressures of this life and know that when I come through the tough times, there is fruit at the end. 
and so much fruit that it's overflowing into the lives of others. Amen? How many can, you t- can, can attest to that this morning? Of course we want the second part of that verse. But how many times do we find ourselves going back into that barren land? Right? We, we start trusting in our own way, in our own will, instead of in the Lord's way, in the Lord's will. We might not intentionally want to turn from God, but we do. We find ourselves in the rut of doing it our own way. Clint preached a great message on Wednesday night about being in, align, in, in alignment with God, and that's what we have to be. The thing I noticed about these two verses was there's no in-between. You hear me? There's no gray area. There's no, well, I can sometimes trust you, but then there's sometimes I don't want to trust you. I want to go my own way. There's no gray area there. It's either you trust him and you're fruitful in life, or you don't trust him and you live a barren, unfruitful life. Amen? There's no in-between. The scripture is, is clear. I really don't know how people live life without trusting God. I know that when, um, which I'm going to share a little bit about my testimony, but um, when I was living in my own trust and in my own way, I failed miserably. But when I began to trust him, I don't know how I could have gotten through our oldest son's anxiety and depression at times feeling like he might commit suicide. I could not have done that without trusting that, the God, that God was going to provide um, my oldest son, Kaysen, it was so hard to watch him um, lose his first uh, baby through a, a miscarriage. It was hard. There's no words that a mama can say to mend that broken heart when he went through that. Amen? There's no words that I could have said to Caden as he fought a year with an injury and didn't know why. What God was doing in that moment in his life, all there was for me to do is to pray boldly with confidence that God was going to see them through. Amen? My daddy, he was um, diagnosed with cancer. A little radiation. We had to pray that that radiation was going to heal him, and it did. Amen? All of those situations, all of those scenarios, the Lord did provide. All I had to do was trust and not falter from that. He provided the fruit on the other side. Sometimes it's hard for us to see it in the moment, but he will provide it in the end. Amen? So now, right now, currently, I'm going to fight the rain, it sounds like. Um, We're trusting in the healing of our grandson, Brayson, who has failed several hearing tests and goes to Cook's um, on the 21st. So the Lord will provide in that healing. Um, I knew I would cry at this part. He's going to provide the moment that we get to get on the airplane, Lord willing, um, to make it to Missouri to see Steve face to face for the first time to make sure that the Lord did provide the way for him because right now we don't know that. We just have to be trusting in the hope and confidence that Jesus is going to see him through, and he will. It'll be a testimony when it does, when it happens. Amen. So the good news this morning through all of those testimonies is that no matter um, where you are today, whether you are trusting or not trusting, um, God wants you to trust. He wants to uproot you in your um, unfaithfulness, willing to trust in his plan. Amen. And I know that many of you are here today because somebody, God used somebody to get you here. Some of you, it's your first time here today, and if you think it was in your own will, in your own way that you're here, you're wrong because somebody probably prayed you, invited you, led you here to this place. And if nobody did, then it was God that put it on your heart to be here today. Amen? So I'm thankful for that. We're going to look at Paul's testimony in Acts 9, so if you would... Go to Acts 9 with me. So if if it's not the sweats, it's the dry mouth. The sweats are good, but no, it's a dry mouth. Amen. I, um, I think I would have married Paul, maybe, if Clint hadn't been around, because 
<laughs> if I lived back in that time, he's just, um, wow, it's just so many great words, um, so many great Bibles in the story that I just fall in love with, and I think I love Paul, um, so I can't wait to meet him in heaven someday. <laughs> Amen. You got some shoes to fill, babe. <laughs> All right, we're going we're gonna to read quite a bit of this story. I, just, it, I know most of you have probably heard it, but we're going to read it anyway. So starting in verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul, who was now Paul later, was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest. He requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked, and the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless, for they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he, his eye, when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his compa- companions led him by the hand to Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat nor drink. Now there was a believer in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street to the house of Judas. When you get there, ask the man, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying to me now. I have shown him a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and laying hands on him so that he can see again. But Lord, exclaimed Ananias. Anybody there all the time? That's me. But Lord, it's scriptural, right? So we can maybe justify asking God, but why? But Lord, exclaimed Ananias, I've heard many people talk about the terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem, and he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls upon your name. But the Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. So Ananias went and found Saul. He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterward, he ate some food and regained his strength. Saul stayed with the believers in Damascus for a few days. So there's some things, you know, when I was preparing for this message, I kept wanting to use a woman in the Bible because it's Mother's Day, right? It just seems like that would be fitting for today. But the Lord just kept pushing me to this scripture, and so here it is. There's a few things that the Lord, I feel like, wants to tell us in this scripture. Number one is Jesus makes it personal. Amen? He makes it personal. What fascinates me so much about Paul is that he was first doing his own thing and was turned away from the Lord, rooted in following the law. He was going hard against Jesus and his followers. He was, he was even going after the women, which in that time was, you know, pretty bad. But the calling on his life was so strong that he could not fight it. In verse 4 through 5, the Lord calls to him when he was expecting it, when he wasn't expecting it, and asks, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who are you, Lord? He knew of the Lord. He knew the Lord. Who are you, Lord? I believe in the midst of Paul doing what he was raised to do, what he was comfortable doing, what he knew how to do best, right? He knew of the Lord. I'm sure he had seen things, witnessed, heard. He, he, he walked in the same time as Jesus. I'm sure he saw all of that. 
It wasn't until he encountered Jesus on his own, afflicted by blindness, anxiety, and possibly fear, causing him not to eat or drink for three days. Until he encountered Jesus on his own, not through his mom or his dad or his grandparents, his own personal encounter with the Messiah did he turn from his sin. He didn't study it. He didn't have to look into it. He didn't have to go to all of his friends and family and ask what they thought about it. He instantly turned as hard for Jesus as he was against Jesus. If you have had a personal relation, uh, in personal counter with Jesus, I encourage you. If you haven't, sorry, if you haven't had a personal encounter with Jesus, I encourage you to seek him for your own self. If you have had a personal encounter with Jesus but are still having doubts and needing to talk to others, try to work it through, I encourage you to seek him. See what his word says. See what he has to say about it instead of what everybody else has to say about it. Amen? So he is personal. He is personal. Number two, it has to be a yes. Amen? When God calls you, it has to be a yes. This has not been easy for me. Again, I'm not up here by my own strength. I'm up here because God called me to do this today. So it makes me think, if Paul had, t- had not encountered Jesus that day, if he had not gone in the way that God wanted him to go, what would the Bible look like? It'd be much littler. <laughs> there wouldn't be as much chapters in the Bible. Think of all the people that he would not have um, met, met and reached Because later on in Acts, it tells us that the church grew because of his ministry. Amen? So if you're fighting against a calling on your life today, you need to think about the people that you're going to miss out on when you say no. It has to be a yes. It has to be a yes. In Jeremiah 1, 5, God says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, of course, he was talking about the prophet Jeremiah here, but the, the same calling is, is on our lives today, right? We need to be his witness, his disciple, to draw all men unto him. In Galatians 1.13 Paul is talking to the Galatians, and he said, the grace of God called me from my mother's womb. So while Paul was going against God, doing all of the things against God, he had a calling on his life to follow God, and God was going to make darn sure that he followed it. Amen? Amen. He's done this in my life as well. Um, I was living um, in my own way, and the, and the Lord interrupted my path um, at this time. So uh, we, I was raised in the church. We went, went to church um, as a kid, and so I knew of the Lord. I didn't have a personal relationship with the Lord, but I knew of the Lord. And um, then come my freshman year, we moved to the Metroplex. And, um, you know, for one reason or another, we just, we just couldn't get back into going in the church. Maybe it was you know, the, the jobs that were keeping us, maybe because my parents had teenagers and we were rebellious, you know, I don't know what, what, what it was, but we just kind of stayed out of church, and so during that time, I was falling farther and farther away from the Lord and more and more into the things of the world that were tugging at me, um, and I just, I'll be really transparent here, I kind of went wild, so I made a lot of just really bad choices um, uh, during my college years, um, doing it my own way. So I was living a life of uninhabited, salty land. I got pregnant in college outside of marriage, um, married later on to try to make things right, um, caught in a cycle of just a really unhealthy marriage. Uh, we were in and out of counseling um, in all of that time, um, got pregnant again, but during all of those failures, um, the Lord has, I mean, he provided. He provided me with two great kids um, and four great grandchildren right now, you know. And so in the midst of, of my unsalty land, God was still providing the, the blessings, even though I wasn't seeing it. 
Um, during that time, my ex also got saved, and now he's writing weekly devotions um, and sending those out. So if, 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 if it was for nothing else, it was for the blessings in that time um, of my life. So I finally graduated from college, got my first real job here in Comanche. Um, I, always, I, I really never questioned why Comanche. I just felt like it was because it was closer maybe to my family. Um, my other option was Ozona, so way out West Texas. So I had the two job offers um, that I could take, but I chose Comanche in my own will, in my own way, because it was closer. Little did I know this was where I was going to be rooted, and this was the city that God was going to use me in. Amen? So um, even through all of that being rooted in all of my self stuff, um, never seeking God's true direction for my life, yet God was leading me here for this calling. So I'm, I'm so thankful for that. Um, I, feel, I, I was finally born again um, when I was 38, and it was when we first started coming back to or coming to Abiding Life, um, Zach and Tiff invited us here and you know he said hey this church isn't for you know everybody but come on and I mean I just I'm, I'm like many of you my testimony is the same as many of you I walked in and I instantly felt the presence of the Lord and I felt a change in my life and all of those things that I was carrying around from my unsalty land was um was set free was let go and so I, I, wasn't, I wasn't perfect. I wasn't, I, I was just still a mess with Jesus, right? I mean, I, I was now a mess, but now I was relying on Jesus to help me through my mess. And so um, I wasn't perfect by any means. I really still at that time didn't feel fully worthy to even be a pastor's wife. When Clint got called into ministry, I was just doing the wifey thing, and I was just, you know, following along beside him because I knew that that's what God wanted for his life. But little did I know that God was preparing me for my own life with Christ. Amen? Because we can't have a relationship through our husband or through, you know, somebody else. We have to have our own personal relationship through, um, through him ourselves. So... Um, Jesus didn't uh, condemn Paul for persecuting the believers. He simply led him in the direction of where he wanted him to go. He didn't persecute Dina for the things that she did. She's just, he's just leading her in the, in the path of where, she, of where he wants her to go. Amen? So I want you to replace your name in Jeremiah verse 15. I'm going to use mine. For Dina is my chosen instrument to take my message to the people around her. You put your name in that verse because that's what God wants for your life. Amen? Yeah, thank you. Y'all are quiet, kind of intimidating up here. <laughs> Amen. Jesus wants to uproot you in your uninhabitable, salty land and root you in your blessings upon blessings, just as the, so as the song we sung this morning. Rooted so deep that it reaches the living water that will sustain us through the heat and long droughts. Amen. Even in the silence, he's still working for our good. But it has to be a yes when he calls. It can't be the gray area in between. It has to be the yes. Number three, deep roots give us strength. We need that strength for the, for the hard times. Looking at verse 16, and I will show him how much he will suffer for my name's sake. You know, a lot of times when we think about God's promises, we think about all the good things, right? God's going to give me um, blessings. He's going to give great forgiveness. He's going to give mercy. He's going to give me eternal life where I can live forever with, in heaven with him. Amen? But he also promises that you will have suffering in this world. It's not a you might, you may, you could. It's a you will have suffering in this world. So if we get stuck in that gray area, when we get to the suffering, when we get to the troubled times, what do we tend to do? 
do it our own way. We tend to trust in our own way and not in God's way. Bearing no fruit. Um, like I said, I was not perfect after I was born again. As we, When we were pastors in Hamilton, um, I, I still made a whole lot of mistakes and really didn't even know what in the world I was doing. Um, tried to follow as closely to, to what God wanted as I could. But um, there was this one thing, if you know our testimony, before uh, Clint got called into ministry, he came home from um, work one day and just started pouring all the alcohol out of our cabinets. Just down, I mean, it was just, it was kind of like in a movie, you know? I mean, he was just pouring, pouring, pouring. And I was like, what are you doing? You know, I need those, I need those drinks. And he's like, no, if we're going to serve the Lord, we're going to, we're going to serve him wholeheartedly. And so he was just pouring and pouring and pouring. Well, when we were in Hamilton, I would justify having one glass of wine. I wasn't doing it to get drunk. I wasn't doing it to, you know, to get drunk, I guess. I was just, you know, doing it to relieve the stress, the overwhelming feeling, the anxiety that I was feeling. I was just, I was having that, I was going to that one glass of wine. So here's what the Lord says about that. Proverbs 16, 1 through 3. No faith. You got to see this if you don't have your Bible. Amen. Thank you. We can make our own plans, but the Lord gives the right answer. People may be pure in their own eyes, but the Lord examines their motives. Commit your actions to the Lord, and your plans will succeed. For me, my motive was I was going to the glass of wine for the feelings, for the relaxation, for the decrease in anxiety or overwhelming feeling, right? For the buzz of that particular moment in that particular time. That was for me. That was my, the motive of my heart. I wasn't going to prayer. I wasn't going to scripture. I wasn't going to my prayer warriors. And I definitely wasn't going to the Lord with all of, all of that anxiety and overwhelming feeling. I was going to the glass of wine. Which never satisfies, amen. Never satisfies. If if you're in that in if you're in that mode right now where that's what you're doing is you're stepping in that gray area and you're sometimes trusting and you're sometimes not trusting, I'm gonna rely on my own things, then sometimes it's just it the Lord intensifies it. Amen. The last glass of wine I had, the Lord intensified my anxiety so bad I just wanted to crawl out of my skin. It was as if the walls we were in a, at, at, a, at a marriage conference of all things. And um, I, I told Clint, I said, I'm going to have to go to the room. I mean, I tried to take a bath and wash it off. It was just like I could not get rid of, the, of that feeling. And at the time, I didn't really know what it was, but I believe God was cleansing me of the desire to go to the wine. He was cleansing me of the desire to want to go to him instead. Amen. So I was really hoping that with the clearing of the wine and no more desire to go that way, that my anxiety would flee too, right, in the name of Jesus. But it didn't happen that way because God says there will be suffering. So about three years ago, um, the beginning of school, I, I had a severe anxiety attack. I just, it just really crippled me. And I, I could not, everybody kept asking, what is it, what is it, what is it? And I didn't know what it was because I was at school. I mean, I was in the place that I love. I was in my comfort zone, you know. And, and I just couldn't, I couldn't shake it. And so uh, my, my assistant principal ended up taking me um, to Dr. Molly. And, um, we, that, you know, they just prayed, they prayed for me. They didn't really know me at that time. Um, because we were still in Hamilton, and they were kind of new to the church here, and um, so she prescribed me some meds, and I started taking the meds, hoping that that would, you know, rid the anxiety, but it just, it kept intensifying. Pastors came and prayed for me, and it was just like I was just this numb, walking zombie, you know, of anxiety. I did not care if I lost my job. 
I mean, Mr. Stonky kept calling, Dina, you know, are you, are you okay? Checking with Clint, are you okay? And at that time, I just really didn't even care. I did not even care if I even went back again. But then Sunday came, and I said, you know what? I didn't, really didn't even want to come to church that morning. I wanted to just stay home in bed, but I came, and during altar call, I came to the front, and pastor prayed for me, and I sat at that altar right there, until God freed me from that anxiety. Amen. Now, there's probably some doubters in the house saying it's probably the meds, but it wasn't the meds, okay? Because at the time, my husband said, I think you should probably just get rid of the meds because we need to trust that God can heal you from this anxiety. So for me, I'm not, gonna, I'm not speaking for you, There's no judgment in whatever you're doing to get through the hard times in life. But for me, the motive of my heart wanted to be to trust fully and completely in Jesus. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So what I didn't realize at that time was that he was preparing me for what was to come. Um, I led a lesson study at school. Um, a very successful lesson study where I was able to um, reach a lot of teachers in, in, just, in both ways, in the classroom and out of the classroom. Um, the Lord gave me the vision of the, of the Bible study to bring all of the churches together in the community, and I could not have done that on my own. I, I doubted the fact that I could even get it done, but it happened, and it, was, it went far exceedingly among anything that I thought that was gonna was going to happen at that time so I'm so thankful besides the fact of me being up here speaking to you today so God had to just really cleanse me fully and completely of going to other things there's no gray area there's no in between verse five and six seven and eight there's either you trust him or you don't amen So four, my final, is be rooted in the way, his way, not your way. In verse two, Paul says he was going to arrest any followers of the way he found. And I've read this story over and over. I've heard it over and over, and I guess I've just blown through that. But for some reason, this time, it just stuck out to me, the way. I want to be in the way of the Lord. Amen? I want to be in the way of the Lord because Scripture tells us He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. Amen? I want to be in His way. So as I close, and I promise that I'm not going to do multiple closings like the, like, the, like the guys do. Amen? Yeah? Okay. Because I've been, remember, I've been up since four preaching to you, and Clint has a, you know, brisket on at home, so I'm ready. Amen. (laughs) So here's my questions for you today, because remember, it's not about me and my motives. It's about you and your motives. Amen. So I'm going to ask you, are you rooted in the way of the Lord, or are you rooted in your own way? If you find yourself rooted in unforgiveness, discontentment, and bitterness, which I have been all of those this year, all of those, he can melt away all of that when it's in his way. Amen? If you find yourself in the gray area between the scripture, justifying your motives, I'm not getting drunk. It's just one vape. It's just one more pill. Right? It's just one more. It's just one more. It's just one more. There's no gray area. Amen? So I encourage you to choose today. If you don't know what God says about being lukewarm, look it up. Search the motives behind your in-between. And if you had an encounter with Jesus and you were still allowing doubt to creep in, I don't know about that. I'm not really sure about that. I pray that you fully surrender and allow, allow the personal encounter to make that decision for you. Amen? Not the enemy, because he's probably barking in your ear right there trying to tell you the opposite of what is true. 
and to be to to remember that being his chosen instrument in his message he wants you to be his instrument and take his message to the people around you amen so would you stand with me t- today thank you again for putting up with me this morning Um, I know God had this word for you. I know God had this word for you, and you were here for a divine purpose this morning. So um, we're going to open the altars today for you to come and to visit with the Lord about um, anything that, that has touched your heart today. Would you pray with me? Father God, again, I thank you, Jesus, for... This morning, God, I thank you that your presence met us here like it does every time. God, I pray that if we are in an area, a gray area in our life where we're just, we want to trust you, but we just don't know how to trust you, God, that you would lead the right people to to, to them, Lord Jesus, that their hearts would be open to receive, God, that the doubt would flee in Jesus' name. God, I pray that if they've had a personal encounter with you this morning, Lord Jesus, that you would just intensify that. God, help them to be surrounded in your way, Lord Jesus, in all things. Help them to to search their hearts, Lord Jesus, for the motives behind what they do, God, and to see that your way is far better. It's far greater, Lord Jesus, than anything that this world can offer for us. God, we thank you again for the worship. God, we thank you the way that you come in and personally connect with each and every one of us. I thank you, Jesus, for using me to be your hands and feet in this time. In your name I pray. Amen.